Uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, our next chapter, which I think is chapter nine. And uh, this chapter is uh, another chapter on imperfect competition. And what we're going to look at today is externalities. Now, when we um, when we think of the market and uh, we have a demand curve and a supply curve, I want you to think about what those curves represent. The demand curve represents the marginal benefit uh, of the product to the consumer. Uh, not the marginal benefit, the, the benefit of the product to the consumer, the price that the consumer is willing to pay for the product. And that price is going to depend on <clears throat> how much utility that, that product gives to the, to the consumer. So if a product offers a lot to the consumer in terms of their consumer satisfaction, if the product is particularly useful or if it's a really nice luxury product, then we'd say that product has a lot of utility and the consumers are willing to pay for it. So the demand, uh, the, the demand curve is all about the satisfaction that the product gives to the consumer, and that satisfaction will equal the price that they're going to pay. More satisfaction, more utility equals a higher price. Now, what, is the what does the supply curve represent in perfect competition? In perfect competition, the supply curve represents the cost of making the product. So uh, in particular, it represents the marginal cost of making the product. And usually we say for most products, the marginal cost is, is rising. And uh, firms have to get a price equal to the marginal cost of making the product so that they can pay for its manufacture. They can pay for making it. So the price um, will equal the marginal cost all the way along the supply supply curve in perfect competition. So we've got a demand curve and a supply curve in the market, and they are all about the, the consumer demand and the marginal cost of supply. Today, we're going to look at this market in a slightly different way because we're going to introduce the concept of externalities. For some products, uh, there is a cost of supplying the product and that product is paid by the supplier. It's paid by the manufacturer of the product for the resources that they require to produce the product. But sometimes products come at an extra cost. They may also come at a cost not only to the supplier, but also to the society in general. So I wanted you to think about the manufacture of a product like paint, for example. If when, when a big paint company produces uh, paint, people, uh, they, they pay a certain cost of production to produce the paint. They pay for the chemicals, they pay for the container of the paint, the marketing, etc. all the costs of producing the paint. But there may be invisible costs of that paint. Uh, there may be costs that are not immediately apparent in the market. I'm going to give you an example of another cost of producing paint. When you produce paint, you, uh, you also produce chemicals and you produce chemical waste. And so that pollution, uh, if there's chemical pollution and that flows into a river or into the ocean, then or into the sky in the form of smoke, uh, if there is some form of pollution attached to producing that paint, we'd say the cost is actually higher because as well as supplying, uh, as well as paying for the resources inside producing the paint, the containers, the chemicals, etc., there's also another cost. But that cost is different to the previous cost we considered because it isn't falling on the supplier. It's falling on the society who have to deal with the 
dirty water or deal with dirty air. So we say that in the production of many products, there's not only a private cost to the supplier of the product, there's also a social cost to supplying the product. And it's this social cost that uh, sometimes firms, well, firms if they can, uh, will ignore that social cost uh, because they're really just concerned with their own profit. Likewise, in demand, sometimes when we demand a product, uh, we're, we're always thinking about the benefit to us. But at other times, uh, when we consume that product, there may be a wider benefit that we're not considering. I want to give you the example of a flu vaccination or a COVID vaccination. When we go and get a COVID or flu vaccination, what are we thinking about as consumers? What we're thinking about is ourselves. We're thinking about the benefit to ourselves of of getting the, the vaccination. And of course, this benefit is in the fact that we're less likely to get the disease or get it more seriously. So that's going to factor in to the price that we pay for that or are willing to pay for that vaccination. But as well as the benefit flowing to us from the vaccination, there may be another benefit. For example, um, uh, if I uh, get the flu vaccine, uh, that's good for me, and I'm really the only one that I'm thinking about. I don't want to get the vaccine. Uh, sorry, I don't want to get the flu, therefore I get the vaccine. But there may be a benefit to my society as well, because if I get a flu vaccine and don't get sick, then that means I can't pass that disease on to someone else. I can't pass it on to the other members of my society. And so... Uh, this is another example where the benefit this time flows not only to the person in the transaction, but people outside the transaction who are not part of demand, who are not part of supply, but they are still affected by the transaction. So that is really what this topic is about today. It's about those um, benefits and costs associated with either consuming or producing a product, uh, which are not part of the central transaction, they're not part of the original demand and supply, but we still need to be aware that they are happening. And sometimes then it's up to governments to, to intervene and try and um, account for these either benefits or costs coming from the externality. So I'm going to now shift to the PowerPoint presentation. I'm just going to start taking you through the slides. All right, so we're, um, we're, we're now dealing with um, uh, the... Uh, part three of our uh, um, imperfectly uh, uh, competitive markets. So you'll remember that when we when we deal with uh, competitive markets, there are a number of characteristics of perfect competition. Right, there are a number of characteristics of perfect competition. Uh, consumers and suppliers are price takers. Goods are homogenous. There are uh, no externalities, uh, goods are excludable and rival, um, and uh, knowledge is there is perfect knowledge, and there is free entry and exit. They are all the characteristics of perfect competition. But we've been looking over recent weeks at ways in which these conditions do not hold up. And so last week, in, uh, where we did monopoly, uh, sorry, when we did for a couple of weeks ago, when we did monopoly, we saw that sometimes firms are price takers and sometimes there's no free entry and exit to the market. So this is um, uh, the, these, these were the characteristics that did not hold up in monopoly. 
What characteristic does not hold up today? And the characteristic that does not hold up today is that uh, there are no externalities. As of today, there are externalities. Right, there, there are externalities. So what happens in this circumstance of imperfect competition? In this circumstance of perfect competition, we're looking at externalities. So we're dealing, we're now in chapter nine. This is our second last chapter. One chapter to go after this. And, uh, and chapter nine is about externalities. So let's just define what an externality is. All right, an externality is a cost or a benefit to someone who is not in the consumer, not a consumer or not a producer, right? They're not a consumer and they're not a producer. That's why we say they are, <coughs> they are, that it, that's why it is an externality. Because these people, right, we'd say these people, i.e., right, i.e., someone, someone who is not in, not in the transaction. Right? They're not in the transaction. They're not the buyer. They're not the seller. But they are affected by the transaction. Someone not in the transaction, but someone who is affected by the transaction. So that's what we mean by an externality. They are external, right? They are external, right? They are external to the transaction. Right, they're external to the transaction. Okay, so uh, when we talk about externalities, externalities can come in two forms. All right, they can they can come in two forms. First of all, uh, we could say externalities come from uh, externalities can be both good or bad. So you can have positive externalities or negative externality. So a positive externality is good for society. There's a benefit coming from the, uh, the from the transaction. Of course, a negative transaction, well, a negative transaction is going to be bad for society. So that's what we mean by a positive transaction. And these, tra and these externalities might come because someone else has consumed the product or because someone else has made the product. So the, the benefit or cost might come about because of the production or it might come about because of the consumption. So I'm going to give you uh, an example of... Um, a couple of these things, right? I'll give you an example of a couple of these things. So um, let's let's clean this slide and let's think about a product that where society gets a positive benefit because of the consumption of a product. So I would say, here's an example, I think, e.g., a vaccine. I've just mentioned... Right, I've just mentioned the vaccine. Now, why is society getting a, a benefit when someone consumes a vaccine? Because when someone consumes a vaccine, uh, other people uh, become also safer from the disease. What is a, uh, a, an example of a negative? What's an example of a negative consumption externality? Well, I would say... E.g., cigarette smoke. So, you may not be a smoker of cigarettes. You may not be a 
you may you may not be a uh, a producer of cigarettes but if someone is smoking cigarettes then then when they consume their cigarettes and if you are nearby and you don't like the smell of cigarette smoke or you have asthma or something like that then you have um uh you, you have um uh some <coughs> uh, you're going to have some some negative effect i'll just do one more um I, i've already mentioned uh this one when we think about uh, a negative effect of production let's think of of producing something right let's think of producing something that that may have a a um a, a negative effect on us so if if we're thinking about a negative production externality i would say anything that produces right where the production include uh, produces pollution so if the production of something produces pollution we'd say there's a negative uh, production uh, externality and um, I'll think a little bit more as we go through the lecture. I might give a positive uh, production externality on the way through. But my slide is getting a bit crowded there anyway. So that's what we mean by uh, production and consumption externalities. And we also uh, think about consumption, uh, 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 positive and negative externalities. So let's think about a negative uh, production externality. Uh, m so this would occur when we're making uh, production, uh, when we're making decisions without accounting for the external cost, and this might represent what we refer to as a dead weight loss. So let's think about this. I'm going to give you an example here of of an externality where an externality applies. So uh, I'm I want you to think about bees. All right, I want you to think about bees, and we are in we're in the we're in the business of of the production of honey. All right, so we're going to we're thinking about making honey. So here it is. We're making honey. Right, production of honey. Okay. So the firm is making honey and the firm has a number of beehives. The firm has a number of beehives. And, um, uh, and so as a result of making the honey, we know that the firm, we know that um, in, in the making of honey, we know that in the making of honey, um, the, the bees are involved in the making of honey, people will buy honey. So there's the honey maker and the honey consumers. They are inside the transaction. But I want you to think about who are outside that tra tra uh, transaction of making honey, but who may be positively and negatively affected by the production of honey. Now, one group that will be positively affected is anyone with... Uh, um, a farm or plants surrounding that those beehives because those bees as well as making honey will be flying off into the surrounding countryside and they will be pollinating the plants so they will be allowing those plants to flower and re and reproduce and although the farmer next to the beehives has nothing to do with the with the beehive business. They don't own it. They don't buy from it. They don't sell to it. They're still benefiting from it because their production is being uh, boosted by the um, by the by the contribution of the bees in pollinating their plants. So that is an example of a positive production externality. So I'll, I'll just bring the slide back up for that then. So positive production externality is where someone near the near the um, near the 
uh, honey production uh, gets a benefit of their plants being pollinated. So it's an externality, it's a production externality, right? it's a production externality because the product is being produced, right? It's production externality and it's a positive externality. It's a good, it's a good effect, all right? It's a good effect on the, on the surrounding orchards. However, there might also be a negative externality because also, also near the beehives is a preschool, right? Also near the beehives is a preschool. And, um, and if, the, uh, if the bees, they might fly away from the hives, they may pollinate the trees. But of course, the other thing they may do is sting the children, right? Sting the children at a preschool, right, at a preschool, and it's pretty obvious that this is an externality, it's pretty obvious that it's a negative externality, I'm just going to circle that, a negative sign, it's an ex externality, and of course it's also coming from the production of the honey, so the honey production the honey production is a business in itself, but it has effects outside the production of the honey. It, it has a negative externality on the, a positive externality on the orchard surrounding the honey production, but it also has a negative externality on the preschool near where the honey is being produced. So we're, before we go on then, I'm just going to get you to see the way that we would represent this. How do we represent a negative production externality? Right, how do we represent a negative production externality. Well, let's draw our demand and supply. And I'm going to draw the demand and supply curve for honey. Here is the supply curve of honey. And I want you to think about what's in that supply curve. What's in that supply curve is, <coughs> what's in that supply curve, that is equal to the, what we might call the private, the private marginal cost. That is the cost to the producer of the, of, the, uh, of the beehives, the cost of producing the honey to the producer. And of course, there is also a demand for honey, right? And this, and this honey represents the uh, marginal benefit of the product to the consumer. Right, this represents the marginal utility of the product to the consumer. At the price, at the moment, at the moment, this is the price, and this is the quantity. And then in red, we're going to be looking only at the negative production effect, right? Not the positive production effect, the negative production effect. So in the production of this honey there is an extra cost, right? It's an extra cost. We're going to call this the, right? This is going to be the social marginal cost. The difference between the private and the public, that represents the externality. This is the extra cost on society, right? This is the cost to society. Now this, this cost is not being considered in the price of honey. But if it was considered in the price of honey, we'd say that the equilibrium is not at the market equilibrium, but the equilibrium is actually what we 
at a point where we call the optimum equilibrium. And the reason we call it the optimum equilibrium is because at this equilibrium, at this where I'm circling in green, at this equilibrium, not only are the private costs being considered, but the public costs are also being considered. The costs of this honey production to society. And we've already seen what that production cost would be. That, that's the cost to the preschool. The preschool might have to spend more money on putting up um, uh, uh, nets um, to, to keep the children safe from, from insects like, like bees. So if we were to take that into consideration, we'd say the price should really be at PO. Because if we were paying all the costs of production, then the price would be higher. There'd be an extra cost, not only the cost of the bees and the beehives, but now the cost of making the preschool uh, safer for the students. And if, if consumers were forced to pay that cost, they would not buy as much honey because now the, the price is higher. So this is how we represent a negative externality. It's how we represent a negative externality. So um, we've got another example from our original set of slides. Of course, you can see this, this new slide production uh, as well as I, as I go through it. But the published slides on, on Moodle, that slide presentation is a little bit shorter. Okay, so let's think about it from another angle. Right, we're going to think about it from another angle. We're going to, and we're going to look at it from a different, uh, uh, the slightly different diagram. So, in this case, we're going to think about not only not a, a production externality, but a consumption externality. And so, it's a consumption externality this time. And not only that, it's not a negative externality; it's a positive externality. So we've got, uh, we imagine that we, we have um, uh, a girl in our class and her name is Maya. And <coughs> Maya, she likes perfume. All right, she likes perfume. Uh, and she wears it all the time. And so she comes to class and she's wearing this very nice perfume and she manages or she sits down either by accident or on purpose, next to Benji. All right, so there's Maya and there's Benji. And I want you to think about what Maya does, right? Maya is the, is the demander of perfume. Benji is not a demander of perfume. However, although he is not a demander of perfume and he doesn't wear perfume, Think about Benji for a minute. He's sitting next to Maya, right? I'm Benji. Maya's sitting over here to the side of me. She's wearing this very nice perfume. Uh, I really like Maya and I really like her perfume. And so I didn't buy the perfume. I didn't sell the perfume. I didn't wear the perfume, but I love the perfume. So uh, that, so we'd say, well, the benefit of the perfume is not just being enjoyed by Maya, it's also being enjoyed by Benji. So we could say Benji really is the member of society and Maya's, Maya's consumption of this perfume is not only giving joy to her, but it's also, it's also giving joy to Benji. So how are we going to represent this is this is um, on a minus this is a mi on a mini scale where we're just dealing with two people right one person consuming the product and the other person being affected by that consumption but it's still it's still an externality so we're now thinking about benji here for a minute we'll just uh, just back to our slides all right so benji uh, loves the perfume all right, he loves the perfume. I'm circling that now. So Benji derives an external benefit from Maya wearing the perfume. So what is the total utility of this perfume? Right, what's the total 
uh, benefit of, of this um, perfume? Well, Maya is getting a benefit, all right? Maya is getting a benefit, but Benji is also getting a benefit. So now there's an extra benefit coming from the consumption of the perfume, right? There's a positive externality, right? A positive externality, and that is being experienced by Benji, all right? Not Maya. Benji. Because why is it external? Because he's not he's not in any perfume transaction. That's why we consider it to be an externality. So a positive consumption externality represents a benefit accrued to benefit accrued to someone who is not involved in the consumption. They're not buying it, they're not consuming it but they still get a benefit from it. So we come over here to the table and um, what we can see in our table is on the left-hand side, right, on the left-hand side of the table, we can see that there is a marginal benefit attached to the, the product, right? We can see that the, there's a marginal benefit attached to the product and We can see that the that um, the external marginal benefit is two dollars. All right, it's it's two dollars, and so uh, if we think about if I take this line over here, if I take this line here, I will see that I will see that we can see Myers benefit of the product here, but we can also see Benji's benefit of the product here. All right, his benefit is the difference between the red line, uh, sorry, the blue line and the orange lines. His benefit is the difference between the blue line and the orange line. So that vertical height, that is the positive, positive externality here, right? That's the positive externality and so um, if we if we think about well um, if we if we think about this idea for a minute uh, there's a positive externality it's the vertical difference between those two lines so I'm going to just uh, correct I'm just going to erase these uh, what I've drawn here and essentially we've got two demand curves here right? Here is the private demand curve, right? That's the private demand curve. But here is the social demand curve. Here's the social demand curve there. So that's is it My drawing function is not working very well here just at the moment. Okay, there we go. So this is this is the demand curve. The top one is the demand curve that we would be counting. This would be the demand curve if we um, if if we um, um, uh, counted Benji's demand in there as well. So then we imagine that at a given price, right, at a given price, um, and let's imagine that the price of the product, it appears to be $8. At the price of $8, this is Maya's demand curve, and she will demand, uh, she will demand four units of the product at $8. <coughs> But if we're looking at the other, if we're looking at the combined demand curve over here, if we're looking at the combined demand curve here, uh, we see that if we were counting D1, they would actually produce, they would actually consume six 
right? They would actually consume six. So uh, more would be consumed if if um, uh, if we counted the externality. If the externality is con would be is is consumed, then uh, more would be consumed. So in the if we just think about this private output for a minute, right? If we think about this private output, I'm circling that again in green, and we bring this over here, we bring it over to the right-hand diagram, four is being consumed, but actually the optimum output, QO, is actually at six. So there's actually so there's a dead weight loss involved here. There's a dead weight loss because this there is uh, more right there is there is more potential surplus to be gained by operating on D1, and the good is being underproduced, uh, underconsumed, right? So we'd say that the good is under consumed where am i going to write this it's under consumed uh, the, 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 um, where can i write it i'll write it down the bottom the good is under consumed in the free market And we call this then, we call this market failure, right? The good is under-consumed in the free market. And we call this market failure because the good is not arriving at the efficient outcome. We are not at QO, right? We are not at QO. We're actually at the market equilibrium, which is, which is good, uh, which, is, which is output of four rather than an output of six. So uh, so we'd say, um, how are we going to get, right? How could we get from four? How could we get from this, this output of four? How could we get to six? Well, one way, right? One way, uh, so how are we going to get to six? How are we going to eliminate this dead weight loss? How are we going to eliminate this dead weight loss? The private consumption gives us four units. The social consumption would give us six units. And so we say that the invisible hand is failing. There's an invisible hand is failing. And so we call this market failure. Now, why is it a failure? because the good gives satisfaction to only uh, it, uh, the good gives satisfaction to um, to Benji uh, and Maya but only Maya's satisfaction is being considered in the market so we call this a market failure there's a dead weight loss there's an under consumption of the good so, how can we get how can we get round this? How can we get round this idea? Well, one way we could get around this idea is through private negotiation. Right? One way to get round of this is private negotiation. Okay, so I'll come back, I'll talk to you on the camera. So think about this idea. Maya is consuming the good. Benji also likes her consuming the good, but he's not a buyer of the good. He's not a wearer of the good. And his, his utility derived from that product is not being counted. One thing that could happen, this sounds a bit weird, I realise, is that these two could uh, negotiate um, to, so, that, um, so that Maya buys more of the product. Now, how could they negotiate in order to get Maya to buy more of the product? Well, one thing Benji could do is say, I'm going to give you a couple of dollars every time you buy that product. And uh, for Maya, that effectively makes the, uh, the consumption cost $2 cheaper. 
And so she is now encouraged to uh, buy more of the perfume. All right, that might sound like a bit weird and twisted um, as, as a sort of a negotiation, but we'll think about, go back to the bees and the orchard next to the bees. Remember, the orchard also got a benefit from the uh, from the production of of um, of honey, and the orchard might decide they really like uh, the the honey uh, producer being next door, and maybe they want the uh, honey production to grow because the more it grows, the more their trees get pollinated, the better their orchard is. So one thing they might do again is enter into a private negotiation and say, look. We don't produce honey, but what we will do is we're going to contribute some money to you every time you put more hives in. We'll transfer you some money, and that would allow the bee production to become cheaper for the honey producer, and they would then move, increase their production, and that would allow um, uh, for more honey to be produced, and uh, honey would no longer be underproduced and the dead weight loss would be eliminated. So that's, that's, um, that's how it would apply to the bees and the, and the orchard next door. So let's think about this idea, right? Benji, right? Benny, Benji lets Maya know he likes the perfume. Mia offers to consume two extra units, that is to say, she'll contribute six of the perfume in exchange for Benji paying her two dollars extra per unit. And so in this situation, uh, we can move to a more efficient uh, um, outcome just by negotiation. There is no government involved here. All that happens is that there is a negotiation between one party and the other, and uh, as a result, between them, they can move to a more efficient outcome. And this idea, this idea is known as the Coase Theorem. Right? This idea is known as the Coase Theorem. So, so, um, so how can society... How can society solve externalities? How can society solve the problem of externalities? Well, one way, right, one way is to do it, right, option one is to do it privately. Right, one way is to do it privately. Uh, and so when they do it privately, we call this the Coase Theorem. And, and essentially what we do is that if, if we can trade in an externality, right, if we can trade in an externality, right, now remember, right, e.g., what's Benji's externality, right, Benji's, right, Benji's externality was equal to $2, and so um, there, and, and, um, and so, as a result, Benji is going to give Maya two dollars every time she consumes the the um, uh, product, and she will wind up buying more of the product. I'm just going to see if we've got one more diagram here to do this. Now I'm going to go back to the diagram very quickly. I want you to think about what happens when uh, Benji gives Maya. Two dollars. Originally, Myers' demand curve is here, and then Benji gives her two dollars. So now her demand curve is going to shift out here, right? He, that shifts out there. That will move Myers' consumption from four, right? It's going to move Myers' consumption from four to six, which is also the, uh, which is also the optimum level of output where everyone's marginal benefit is considered. 
So how can we solve it? Well, they just solved it privately. Private. We need a T in there, don't we? Private. Oh, no. Pro yes. I just messed that up. Right, they've solved it privately. Now, where, there are other ways of solving it privately as well. Uh, uh, sorry, there are other ways of solving it as well, uh, apart from the Coase theorem. And, um, and so let's just read this Coase theorem. It says, if a trade in an externality is possible. So let's underline these words. If a trade is, expert, is, is possible, uh, then bargaining will lead to a more efficient outcome, right? Uh, it will lead to a more efficient outcome. In this case, right, in this case, right, in this case here, right, Maya uh, increases her demand for the product and she buys more of the product. So that's a private negotiation between Benji and Maya. And we call this the Coase Theorem. I'm going to clean this slide up here because I want to point out another couple of key words on the slide. And that is, if there are no transaction costs, all right, if there are no transaction costs. Now, imagine this. Benji is willing to give Maya $2, right? Right, Benji gives two dollars to Maya, and then she increases her demand. Right, she shifts her curve. Her curve shifts up by two dollars. So Maya uh, increase pushes her demand curve. Right, pushes her demand curve up by two dollars. All right, that's the way it works, but. Um, imagine that they had to, this this is not just about someone met, wearing perfume and, and getting paid to wear some more of it. Imagine it's some bigger thing in industry or between two firms. Um, what we might find is that it's not that it's not that easy to negotiate then. So if we've got to employ lawyers, this then becomes tricky, right? This becomes tricky. The reason it becomes tricky is because Benji wants to give Maya $2. All right. Maya wants to receive $2. But if you had to pay the lawyer $1, then it's Benji spends his $2, but Maya does not receive $2. And at that point, the system is going to break down. So we, we assume that... Um, all the money that is being paid by one party is being received by another party and none of it is being sucked up in taxes or lawyers costs or any other costs of, of doing you know negotiation any negotiation costs we're assuming that 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 is not occurring all right we'll move on to the next slide so some examples of positive consumption externalities Right, some examples of positive consumption externalities, fitness activities, vaccinations, biking to work. I want you to think about why biking to work would be a positive consumption externality. Well, the reason is, one reason is, because more people bike to work, the less traffic there will be on the road for everyone else. Um, education, when you, when you get, when you enroll for a course, of course, that is good for you, and you're the only one you're really, you're, you're you're the only one you're considering. But it is good for society because it also makes you a more valuable um, employee when you start work. It also means you're likely to earn more and pay more taxes. So these are all examples of of uh, positive consumption externality. Why is it good for me when you get a fire alarm? It's good for me when you get a fire alarm because uh, if a fire starts in your house and you put it out quickly, then that means it won't spread to my house and my house won't burn down. So these are all examples of, of positive consumption externalities.
Okay, now we want to do negative externalities. Negative externalities. And, and we've already done the negative production externality with the bees and the and the preschool. But I'm going to give you another example here because it's got a, a, a slightly different diagram. And the reasons, the reason that these diagrams are different from the original demand and supply diagram is because we're just dealing with one person. And so we can look at the marginal benefit coming to them from, from the production of one extra unit. Uh, we're, we're just dealing on an individual scale. In any case, Benji is selling hot dogs, right? Benji's selling hot dogs. So he's producing hot dogs. Not like Maya, who was buying, she was buying perfume. But Benji is producing. So this is a production externality. And he incurs a marginal cost, right? There's a marginal cost for producing hot dogs. And we know that that marginal cost um, uh, is, is likely to be rising the more heart marginal cost he uh, produces. And when he's thinking about this, he's thinking, all right, well, when, when my marginal cost goes up, I will need to put my price up in order to uh, pay for the uh, extra marginal cost. And then we imagine this. Maya dislikes the pollution uh, that um, that uh, Benji, uh, he, he dislikes the pollution, right? E.g., e right? When Benji makes the hot dogs, right, there may be a smell attached to the production of hot dogs. And so although Benji loves Maya's um, smell of Maya's perfume, Maya hates the smell of Benji producing hot dogs. So um, so there's a negative production externality going on here, right? Negative production externality. We'll just quickly go here uh, just to define it. A negative production ex externality represents, represents the cost incurred by someone who is not involved in the production of the good. That is to say, Maya has nothing to do with the production of hot dogs. But she's in the same neighbourhood as Benji, and uh, she probably thinks Benji's quite creepy. Um, on one hand, he's um, offering to pay her more for wearing perfume, and then on the other hand, um, uh, he's producing hot dogs which are smelling up the neighbourhood. In any case, uh, we're, we're looking here, first of all, on the left-hand side, we're looking at the cost of producing these hot dogs for Benji. So this is the, this, the red curve here is Benji's marginal cost. That's the private marginal cost. You can see that here. It's the private marginal cost. That's the cost to Benji. But as well as the private marginal cost, there's also another cost, right? There's also another cost. This is the external cost. This is the inconvenience, right? This is the inconvenience to Maya's nose every time she has to walk near Benji's hot dog uh, stand. So uh, so that's that's an external cost. And because it's an external cost, Right, that's the external cost. What it does is it moves the supply curve from the red supply curve. It now becomes, uh, well, I can't get a good blue up. I'll see if I can do it in blue. This pen doesn't cooperate with me very well. Uh, instead of that, the supply curve now becomes the line that I'm tracing. It moves from the red to the blue. In other words, the supply curve shifts up. It shifts up by one dollar. So there's a, there's a different supply curve. And so if we then uh, if we then proceed to the next diagram, we can see that the uh, we can see that uh, Benji. Benji will want to produce 
three units of the product. Benji wants to produce three units of the product. Here's Benji producing three units of product per product. Here it is over here. That's where Benji is going to produce. However, uh, if, we, if we really think about this uh, for a minute, um, when, that, when, when Benji is, is producing this, uh, three units, this represents a dead weight loss. That's a dead weight loss. And why is it a dead weight loss? Because this good is being over produced. This good is being overproduced. Why is it being overproduced? Because we are not counting the true cost of supply. We're not counting the true cost of supply. We're not counting the fact that the true supply curve looks like this, right? The true supply curve looks like this, whereas Benji's supply curve looks like this. So this is the this is the private, right? This is the private uh, marginal cost. But the green line is the social marginal cost. And, um, and so uh, the good is being overproduced. There's a dead weight loss. If we were observing, if we were really observing where this good should be produced, we'd say the price, the price is $2, we come out from $2 uh, to where it intersects with the green supply curve, and then we come down and we see our efficient output would be at two. So, um, so how can we, how can we get to that? Let me just sort of do this on a on another diagram. Remember, originally I, I explained to you there's a demand curve, there's a supply curve. But where there's a negative marginal, uh, when there's a negative, um, uh, uh, negative production exter externality, we'd say the the marginal cost to society is higher than than the marginal cost with, to the private producer. And so the negative externality is the difference between those difference between those two curves. So it's just the same, except that the, the principle is the same, except that in in the diagram that we drew previously, we're looking at discrete units. We're looking at one unit, two units, three units, whereas in the next diagram we're not looking at at individual units. We might be dealing with thousands of units. In any case, if we think about the Coase theorem, um, uh, the, 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 the same thing applies with the Coase theorem using the Coase theorem. In the case of a negative production externality, um, uh, this, this does not allow for a maximum social surplus because the good is overproduced. The private optimal is three, but the social optimum is two. So the good is being overproduced, right? The good is being overproduced. Right, the good is being overproduced. So, uh, so there is, there's the, uh, that's the negative production externality. How could we? How the, could these two um, uh, uh, do this? Well, uh, two ways of doing it, right? There's two ways of of negotiating here, and this could be a little bit tricky. Two ways. One, Benji knows he's he's um he's creating an externality, so he offers to decrease by one unit uh, in exchange for Maya paying him a dollar. So Maya says, look, I can't stand this smell. And uh, so what I'll do is uh, I'll pay you a dollar um, uh, for uh, every unit of 
production that you you uh, forego. And so uh, so that brings Benji's uh, um, uh, uh, th that will that will bring the, the two sides of the market into place. So Maya accepts this. All right, Maya accepts this, and uh, and so Benji then is compensated for for re for reducing his um, his his production. So again, there's a private negotiation involved here. There's a private negotiation involved. Now, if I've got time, I'm going to do another more specific example of this uh, towards the end of the lecture. So what we've been doing so far, when we've been looking at Benji and Maya, we've been looking at individuals negotiating with other individuals to sort out externalities. Um, so uh, in the case of negative production externalities, what sort of negative production externalities could we name? Well, uh, of course, when firms pollute and they create carbon, uh, then um, that all contributes to global warming. And of course, we might all wind up suffering from that. Excessive risk taking. <coughs> Why is it? Why is there a negative externality falling on me if you drive dangerously? For example, if you drive dangerously, then that could fall on me in two possible ways. One way is you might drive dangerously and hit me in my, in my car or as a pedestrian. That's one thing. But even if you don't hit me, it still might fall on me because when you take stupid risks, you might hurt yourself you wind up in hospital, maybe you wind up disabled, and for the rest of your life and the rest of my life, I'm going to be paying over, over more taxes in order to um, support you because, um, because of your disability. So uh, these, are, these are examples of, of negative production externalities where the action by one person, the risk taker, uh, has an impact on on other people. Okay, now um, we're now going to look. We're get moving on now, and I want to focus on this idea, right? Large markets, large markets. When we were looking at Maya and and Benji, think about what we were doing with Maya and Benji. We were saying, what happens with Unit One? What happens with Unit Two? What happens with unit three? What happens with unit four? And we could say in the case of a supply curve, marginal cost of unit one, marginal cost of unit two, marginal cost of unit three, marginal cost of unit four. But when we think about when we think about large markets, right, when we think about large markets, um, uh, you know, in here, on this on this diagram, we might not be able to identify one unit, two units, three units, four units, because we we much might be dealing on a much bigger scale. We might be dealing on a million units, and of course, along our line, along our supply curve, for example, or our demand curve, we can't separate those units out. I can't separate unit one from unit two because uh, uh, the, the, the scale just won't let me do it. So we, we, that's why we have a different diagram when we're dealing with uh, large markets. And not only that, when we deal in large markets, it's not possible for one buyer or a couple of buyers to negotiate with a number of sellers. Uh, we, have, we, need, we, need another, we need another way of dealing with um, with our externalities. And the way that we often deal with externalities is by, right, is by government, right? Government may need to solve. Well, if they can't solve, they might at least bring us closer to a solution.
So in this case, negotiation is not possible, and um, so we we look for we look for another <coughs> we look for another solution. So um, uh, think about this for a minute. I'm just going to go down here. All right, so I'm, I'm going to give you two examples, right? I'm, I'm going to give you two here, two examples here. Um, on the, on the left-hand side, I want you to look at the left-hand diagram, and I'm going to get you to think about um, um, what we could do here. So we, we have a, um, I'm going to, Look at this diagram, and we can see that in the private market, right, in the private market, this is the demand curve, and this is the supply curve, and in the private market, the equilibrium would be Q, and the equilibrium price would be P. But then we also say that uh, in, this, in this world, there is also a social benefit, all right? There's a marginal social benefit, and it's this big. So I'm going to say, e.g., vaccination. Now, we know that benefits are counted on the demand curve. So now this demand curve should really be here, right? That's where it should be if we were counting all our all the benefits that flow so here at this point there's a little o little o being circled there that is the that is the that is the equilibrium optimum that's where the equilibrium should be and so the the market should really be operating at qo <clears throat> in other words more vaccines rather than less vaccines should be consumed. And because of that, we should be willing to pay a higher price for them. So the price should really be at PO and the quantity should really be at QO. And so we have to ask the question, how could we make that happen? How could we move the, move the um, uh, equilibrium from P to, oh, sorry, equal, the, the market equilibrium to the optimum. Well, one way would be to pay a subsidy to the demanders. So if government paid a subsidy to the demander, every time you go to the doctor to get your vaccine, the government reimburses you $10 or $20, something like on Medicare, um, then that would move your demand curve. If people were getting a subsidy, from the government, if the government was giving you money towards the your vaccine, it would shift your demand curve out and it would move the equilibrium towards the optimum. So that's, that's an example where we have a positive consumption externality. And then on the next line, on the next diagram, uh, I'm going to clean this up now. I want the, everything to look cleaner. On the next diagram, next diagram, on the next diagram, um, we've got a negative. We've got a we, we've got a negative uh, externality so let's think about this one here let's think about this idea the negative externality so originally the supply curve is shown by the black line originally the supply curve is shown by the black line but in fact there is a negative externality right there's a negative externality this gap between these two lines, that gap there, represents the negative, I'll just abbreviate, the negative social cost, right? It represents the negative social cost. 
So the true, the true cost of supply, the true cost of supply is here, right? The true cost of supply. So we can see, we can see in the diagram the market equilibrium, right? The market equilibrium is where I've drawn the dot, but here the social optimum, the social optimum is here, right? The social optimum is there. That is where, that is where the, uh, that is where the price should be. That's P O. That's where the quantity should be. So we call this, we call this idea, we call this market failure because in the free market, the price is not at P O. The price is at P M. So the price is too low. <coughs> and because the price is too low, the quantity is too high. That's Q. M. The quantity is too high and the price is too low. So uh, think of, let's think about a, a product that might fall into this category. Let's think about a product that might fall into the, that, that category there. I'm going to finish with this diagram in a minute, but I want you to think about what might fall into the category of the diagram that I, I just drew. Think about a product like cigarettes. Now, um, cigarettes definitely have a social cost. How do they have a social cost? They have a social cost in many ways. One, you would all know that if you are near a smoker, then that is going to smell. And many of us will not like that smell. So that's a social cost. Two, if you're near the smoker and you can smell their smoke and you're breathing that smoke in, uh, that might aggravate your asthma. And if you work in a bar or a hotel where people are allowed to smoke, you'll be in that smoke all the time and ultimately you might get sick. So that's a social cost because you're not the smoker, right? You're not the buyer of the smokes necessarily or the seller, but you are affected by it. And a third way in which you are with society is affected by smoking is that um, even if you never meet a smoker, you never meet anyone that sells a cigarette, you're still going to be affected because statistically smokers get sick. When smokers get sick, they are dealt with by our public hospital system and that makes the cost of providing health services, the, the cost of Medicare and the cost of uh, running hospital system more expensive. And so we all pay more taxes because smokers smoke. Right, so that, that is where the negative externality comes from. And so if that is the case, we need to shift our supply curve. We need to shift our supply curve up so that um, uh, it reflects, our, our supply curve goes up because it reflects these higher costs. So, um, so if we don't do anything about those costs, um, then cigarettes remain cheap that's the first thing and secondly because they remain cheap smokers are not discouraged from smoking so how are we going to move our um, equilibrium from the market equilibrium back to the optimum equilibrium well the way that we try and do it in this country of course is to tax the product. So we could say down here that government could tax, right? They, they could tax the externality. They, they could tax the product. And that's what we do in Australia. We tax the product. So when we, when we tax the product, what happens? We add a tax to the product. So over here where the externality is, is drawn, we move the supply curve up when we impose the tax. That pushes the new supply curve, right? It pushes the new supply curve to where I've drawn it so that now uh, either the smoker 
or the producer of the cigarettes uh, is now paying for this tax, depending on the, the distribution, depending on elasticity, that will move the price of the product higher. And when it moves the product higher, it moves the quantity lower so that we move towards the optimum equilibrium. So that's the way that we tend to deal with, that is one way, that is, that is one way that we, we deal with um, negative externalities uh, is to tax the product that is causing the negative externalities and, and that pushes the price of the product up and discourages people from using this, this harmful product. So uh, that's about where I'm going to leave this uh, lecture. Um, I'm going to come back to it next week and explore it in a bit more detail. I'm going to look at other policies that governments might use uh, to correct negative externalities. I'm also going to look more closely at the Coase theorem and I'm going to model a, a sort of a calculation with you uh, around the way in which parties might negotiate with each other um, uh, to, to come up with a more with a more efficient solution. So uh, thanks for your attendance today and I will uh, catch you all next uh, week.